Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and start the evening's activities. Uh, we are starting out tonight with a public hearing um, on the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, the first report. And here to make the presentation is our Executive Director of Finance, Darren Rice. When Mr. Rice is done with the presentation, then there will be a time for public comment. So if you have a comment, if you'll come to the podium and state your name and keep your comments to about two minutes long. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. Good evening, President Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It is my pleasure to present the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas Annual Financial Management Report. The State School Financial Accountability Rating System, known as the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, or School First, ensures that Texas public schools are held accountable for the quality of their financial management practices and that they improve those practices. The system is designed to encourage Texas public schools to better manage their financial resources to provide the maximum allocation possible for direct instruction purposes. Thank you. The School First program currently is going through a transition period, and the year that we're reporting on this year is, is fiscal year 2013-2014, and this is a, a transitional period. Uh, we will only have seven indicators this year compared to 21 in the past, and, and really what they're working on is combining the first report with some uh, additional financial solvency information. And then when we get the new indicators, they will be more easily recognized and interpreted by both the public and the finance industry. <clears throat> The school first rating is based upon an analysis of staff and student data reported for the 2013-2014 school year and budgetary and actual financial data for the fiscal year ended August 31, 2014. The school first accountability rating system assigns two possible financial accountability ratings to Texas school districts. Once again, this is just the transitional period. In the past, we've had four accountability ratings. This year, it's basically pass-fail. And so it's pass or substandard are the two ratings. Conroe Independent School District received a rating of pass. There are seven indicators, a possibility of 30 points. We received all 30 points, so we received a perfect score. And the pass rating is the state's highest, demonstrating the quality of Conroe ISD's financial management and reporting system. The school first rating system rated the district based on the scores received from sep seven separate performance indicators. Each performance indicator was designed to assess the quality of the financial management of the district's resources. Now we'll go through each of the seven indicators. Indicator one, was the complete annual financial report and data submitted to the TEA within 30 days of the January 28th deadline for the district's fiscal year end date, August 31st? And yes, we filed timely. Indicator two, was there an un unmodified opinion in the annual financial report on the financial statements as a whole? Yes, we received an unmodified opinion. Indicator three, was the school district in compliance with the payment terms of all debt agreements at fiscal year end? Yes, we paid our bills. Indicator four, was the total unrestricted net asset balance in the governmental activities column in the statement of net assets greater than zero. Yes, our balance was $42.7 million. Indicator five, was the school district's administrative cost ratio equal to or less than the threshold ratio? Our answer is yes. The acceptable administrative cost ratio for a district with students 10,000 or more is less than or equal to 0 0.0855. Our ratio is 0 0.0367. Indicator number six, did the comparison of PEMS data to like information in the annual financial report result in an aggregate variance of less than 3% of all expenditures by function? Yes, our variance was zero. And the last indicator is, did the external independent auditor report that the annual financial report was free of any instances of material weaknesses in internal controls over financial reporting and compliance for local, state, and federal funds? And the answer is yes, we received a clean audit. Uh, now we're required to have some additional disclosure information uh, for the annual financial management report. And the first is any reimbursements that were received by the superintendent or board members. 
And as we look at, uh, Dr. Stockton had uh, reimbursements of $1,782 for meals, lodging, and transportation. And Ms. Jessica Powell had $33 reimbursed for meals. And this is for the year ended August 31st, 2014. The next is any outside compensation and or fees received by the superintendent for professional consulting and or other per personal reasons. And there was none received. The next is any gifts received by executive officers and board members and first degree relatives, if any, and gifts that had an economic value of $250 or more in the aggregate in the fiscal year, and there were none. Now, any business transactions between the school district and, and board members? We do have one, uh, Mr. John Husbands, in the amount of $560,645. And I would like to note that the above amount reflects normal business transactions between Conroe ISD and the employers of Mr. Husbands, which is Souls Insurance. Mr. Husbands receives no commissions from these revenues, and his business relationship predates his membership on the Board of Trustees. Uh, now we're required to report our first quarter of the 14-15 school year expenditures. In payroll, our first quarter expenditure was $64.1 million. Our con contracted services, $10.6 million. Our supplies and material, $7.8 million. Other operating expenses, $2.1 million. Debt service was zero. Capital outlay, $656,000. Now some additional solvency questions. Within the last two years, did the school district draw funds from a short-term financing note? The answer is no. Did the school district for the prior fiscal year have a total general fund balance less than 2% of the total expenditures for general fund function codes 11 through 61? The answer is no. Question number two. Has the school district declared financial extendency within the past two years? The answer is no. Question number three, provide comments or explanations for student to staff's ratios significantly more than 15% below the norm. We have, we have had no instances of the ratios below the norm. Uh, question number four, how many superintendents has your school district had in the last five years? And that is one. And the last question is, how many business managers has your school district had in the last five years? And the answer is one. And the last thing, we're, we're required to uh, have a copy of Dr. Stockton's contract. I'm not going to sit here and read it. It is available. Uh, this presentation is available on our website. So if you would like to uh, peruse any of this uh, information, it will be available for you. And that is all. Okay, at this time, if anyone has a comment, please come to the podium and, and make your comments. Anybody at all? Okay. Heavy no takers. Uh, that concludes our, our budget present. Our, our first presentation. Thank you. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show a quorum of members is present. That the meeting has been duly called, and that a notice of this meeting has been posted, in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter Five Five One. The time is uh, six oh seven. If you would stand with me while uh, Mr. Hubert leads us in the invitation and Mr. Williams in the pledge. Dear God, we are grateful for this day that we have together here in this in this beautiful building. We are grateful for the, the many talents of the people in the room and, and their dedication to uh, to this school district. We, we ask a special uh, blessing to be upon us and all those in attendance today that we may conduct ourselves in an orderly manner that we will discuss the issues of this school district and have the one goal in mind which is to improve the school district and bring bring the best we can to these students of this school district and we are we're grateful for this time when we say this prayer in the name of jesus christ amen, amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor and praise to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you very much, Mr. Hubert, Mr. Williams. Item 2A, Patrons, in, patrons Influencing Education Award, uh, Dr. Stockton. Can we have Dr. Weatherly, who's principal of Conroe High School here tonight, to introduce our special recipients. Dr. Weatherly.
Mr. Husband, school board members, Dr. Stockton, thank you for allowing me to introduce these fine young gentlemen. While walking home after school on Friday, September the 11th, four Conroe High School students stopped to help a disabled man when his car broke down on Highway 105. The boys, along with an adult who saw them, worked together to push it into a parking lot. It was raining that afternoon and a Conroe resident took a picture of the kind gesture and posted it to her Facebook account as seen up on the screen at this time. The picture quickly received over 8,000 likes and certainly generated a positive image for themselves, their families, and Conroe High School. I want to recognize this act of selflessness and let them serve as an example for all of us. Because of their kindness, they are receiving the Patrons Influence Education Award this evening. The four st students are Christopher Dyer, Chance Plumley, Jose Mungia, and Luis Villarreal. Great job. Come on. Sir, if you put him here facing that way. Dr. Weatherly, uh, on, on behalf of the board and, 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 uh, and, and Dr. Stockton, I would just like to say that uh, we are, are privileged to already know what kind of kids you have at Conroe High School, but I think this is great that the public shares, you know, it, it, it's shared with the public that, that uh, you have pe people over there that you're growing students that care about others. And that's all I can say is it doesn't get any better than that, guys, when you care for your fellow man. That's what it's all about, okay? Thank you for your selfless act. Thank you for being leaders, okay? And one more thing. A pie award would not be a pie award patronizing, patrons influencing education without pies. <laughs> So but before these young men leave, let's give their, their parents an opportunity to stand up and be recognized. Yes, Thank please. you for raising such great voice. Mr. Husbands, I want to point out it's probably the last time it rained in uh, Congo. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, pray for rain. Okay. Uh, item 2B, special district recognition, BAM, because art matters. Dr. Stockton? Yeah, we have a very special presentation today. Um, the Conroe School District has a great relationship with Mo Montgomery County Juvenile Probation. And here uh, tonight is the executive director, Ron Leach, and he has a very special presentation to make. Thank you, Dr. Stockton, and thank you to the board for allowing us to be here tonight. Over the past two years, we've had the privilege to collaborate with the Woodlands Waterway Arts Council on several projects. Uh, they have come into our detention center. They've been in our Juvenile Justice Alternative Education Program. And they come in, and in a moment, the uh, director will explain the concept behind the program. But tonight, we're here to dedicate a piece of artwork that was recently completed, and it's going to be displayed permanently 
in the courtroom for the Honorable Mary Ann Turner County Court Law Number 4. She currently sits as our mental health court judge, and she has actually participated in the painting of it. On the back side, each student who worked on this has signed it, and the majority of the students wore Connor ISD students. So, but I have the privilege to introduce to you Raylene Barton. She's the director of Because Arts Matters, which is with the Woodlands Waterway Arts Association. And she will explain the concept and, and the meaning behind this, this, uh, this program. Raylene? Thank you, Ron. It, it is Kayleen, just so you know. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's a weird name and people get it mixed up all the time. But I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to come and to introduce you a little bit to the Woodlands Waterway Arts Council and Because Art Matters. Um, our vision is we believe the arts can open the doors of our minds, strength and character and heal our bodies. And we see that every day in the students that we work with. We mentor youth. We work with those with special needs and circumstances. We serve senior citizens and we forge partnerships in the community and this is just one of the wonderful partnerships that we've been able to work with so um, if you want to turn around and take a good look at that beautiful painting back there that was presented by our master artist Vicki McMillan and she couldn't be here tonight she apologizes she had a family emergency but she is incredibly talented and has been with our organization for many years and this was created um, along, it was a collaboration with the Montgomery County Juvenile Probation, the Juvenile Detention, and the Juvenile Alternative Education Program. And they worked collaboratively to create the 60 by 40 acrylic on canvas mural, and it will be displayed, like we said, in the Montgomery County Juvenile Courtroom. Um, the reason it was created was to create a talking point for the judge on finding your inner serenity and hope and its direction for young minds to go to regroup and refocus on their life and to remember that the decisions we make now aren't the final decisions in our life. We always have an opportunity to change and to become a little bit better. So we took this idea and we first presented it to um, their organization and they love the idea which we're very grateful for their collaboration. And then we took it to the students and every single student that participated had a paintbrush on that project. And as the image emerged out of the canvas, it was neat as the discussion as they talked about it and as they talked about it and they talked about the beautiful serenity that they saw they actually named the piece and they called it the way it should be and they talked about wouldn't that be nice if we had made better choices or if we make better choices that's the way it should be our life should be peaceful so um, in the mural also is a cardinal amongst the trees and this was an idea that Judge Turner had to remember there's a wonderful story that goes with cardinals but it's to remember that we're never alone in our journey in life and that's a real highlight in this beautiful mural as well and so it inspired one of the students so greatly that she wrote a poem and Judge Turner's going to share that with you before we leave but we were so grateful for this opportunity. It was sponsored, of course, by the Woodlands Waterway Arts Council, um, by very generous donors and sponsors in the community, and also by a grant from the Texas Commission on the Arts. Because Art Matters, we're so grateful for the opportunity to work with the Montgomery County Juvenile Probation, Detention, the Alternative Education Program up there, and also with Conroe ISD. We, we love Conroe ISD. We work with six schools currently, um, providing funding for them, and we're grateful for the impact that we're able to have in their lives because because art matters so thank you very much good afternoon thank you for having me here this evening and I um, am thrilled our staff is thrilled uh, that our courtroom is going to be the home uh, for this beautiful work of art and uh, I uh, currently sit as the juvenile mental health court judge, and so when I visited with uh, Vicki McMillan, uh, she had indicated, um, what is your message, what is your approach uh, re regarding the children? And uh, generally, we discussed uh, just uh, refocusing and healing and uh, going forward, learning from some of the mistakes that we make. And um, I it sometimes it just takes our ability to just regroup and refocus and I, I am want to praise the board uh, and the Conroe Independent School District for allowing this partnership with the juvenile probation department because it is an excellent program that is there at the juvenile uh, the JJAEP as we call, as I call it so 
and it, it serves a tremendous purpose. Um, Mr. Leach is a tremendous director together with Mr. Gussler, so um, it's perfect. Uh, I do want to read this poem that was written by one of the JJ AEP students, and it was entitled The Way It Should Be, and, and this uh, student, um, I believe all of the, the students came up with the name, but um, in looking at what they were drawing, uh, this is the, the poem. This is more, to, there is more to the outside world than just rejection. We could explore into nature and feel more protection by looking into the water and seeing life more clear. Sometimes looking at the colors makes life feel more secure. There's more to the outside world than another bad reflection. You could hear the trees sing a melody with the interfering wind sent from heaven and let you know life is more than a deception regrouping and refocusing on life. I think they did a, a very fine work in this poem um, is, uh, I believe there's a plaque that will be placed right alongside the poem. So thank you very much. You. Uh, Ron, would you, would you mind introducing uh, uh, your, your guest with, with you tonight? I just want to make sure that everybody gets recognized. Thank you all for being there. Deputy Director of the Juvenile Probation Department, and his, with him is his wife, Peggy Gessler, who is a teacher at Ben Miles. Ben Miles. Ben Miles. So, <laughs> uh, well, thank you for for all your hard work, yes. Judge. Thank you for your support of the school district as well as of, of these young people. And uh, uh, thank the thank the uh, Woodlands Water Waterway Water Art Festival <laughs> Council. I'm sorry, I got, I, I'm like you. I got your name wrong. But anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate you all being here. Okay. <laughs> Item, item uh, 2C, Citizens Participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes, sir. Very good. The next 30 minutes has been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be re reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of five or more must appoint a representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Cheryl Howell. Good evening. Members of the school board and Dr. Stockton, I am here tonight to announce that TSTA Conroe has voted to endorse the school Conroe ISD's uh, bond issue. Uh, I would like to thank Ms. Bush for attending our September meeting and passing on information to our members at that time. I, have, I think that that really helped us to decide. Uh, we'd like to also appreciate all the work that the school board and the committees have gone into to bring this referendum forward, and we look forward to its passage. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. <clears throat> Okay, item three, uh, consent agenda. I've been, uh, it's been requested that we remove item C for discussion. So uh, I would entertain a motion and a second for items A, B, D, E, F, and G. I move approval of the consent agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor are signified by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Good. Now, item three C, uh, school health advisory council. Um, uh, um, sorry, uh, Mr. Hubert asked me to remove that item, so Mr. Hubert, please proceed with any questions you might have or, or statements you have about that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Who, who do I direct those questions to, Dr. Stockton? Dr. Stockton. Dr. Stockton. Hey, just uh, reading through that, I know that this advisory council's got a lot. Uh, reading through the responsibilities that they're going through, recess and uh, school meals and, and uh, vending machines, stuff like that. I saw the list and read through it. I don't have any issues with it. I just was curious if you could explain how we came up with that. Are those, the people on the committee, are they throughout the entire district? Is it county? Could you explain a little yes, bit? Yes, Dr. Hines can do that. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. We've had, we've, we've actually had a, a very active shack the last several years, or school health advisory council, and it includes a representation across representation. In fact, uh, Ron Leach, who just left, was on our council for a few years. Um, and so we've, we've included people from different roles in the community, volunteers, parents, people that have an interest that have reached out to us often to say I have a real strong interest in nutrition, for example, or fitness. Um, so we try to be included. Uh, the majority of our members are parents, and then the rest are comprised of staff members, community members, and other resources. Uh, does that answer? Yes, that answers that. I, you had some doctors on there as well. You had some. Yeah, a lot of folks have just come over the years. We've tried to be, if we've included, for example, someone from Lone Star um, Health Clinic, and we've had folks from different hospitals over the years, and, um, you know, we just rotate it, kind of come, people come and go, but, but uh, we do try to be mindful of representation and location and get representation from all parts of the district. But it is heavily weighted towards uh, people that have interest in these areas. Great. Thank you very much. You bet. Any other discussion, questions? All those in uh, favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. <coughs> Good. Uh, it's been requested that we move items uh, 10A and B forward. So 10A, naming of Deputy Superintendent for Schools, Dr. Stock. Okay, it's my pleasure to, to introduce this item. Um, with, the, uh, with the retirement of Mr. Cox here in the next uh, two months, uh, we're going to slightly reorganize uh, central administration and uh, the newly created uh, position of deputy superintendent of operations. Uh, Dr. Hines is going to move into that position effective January 4th, I think officially it is. Uh, with that, creates an opening for deputy superintendent of schools. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce and recommend to you uh, someone you know well. Uh, Dr. Curtis Null is currently the assistant superintendent for secondary education. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Null as his principal and his, in his uh, role as uh, trainer at the Woodlands High School in every uh, position since then. And it's my pleasure and honor to recommend him for that position. I would be honored to personally make that motion and uh, be looking for a second. A second motion. Thank you very much. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. You left out this stuff. Would you like? Would you like to discuss it? <laughs> I was so I was so confident. I was so confident in Dr. Null's approval that I left out the discussion. He would like to back it up, but I apologize about that. The discussion is over. You are you are the. Could be said I was scared to let you leave it open for discussion. I was I was scared. I don't know. You might not have been. I was. <laughs> Thank you, President Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. Uh, I appreciate the vote of confidence at the opportunity that lies before me. When I first came to this district 15 years ago, I could never imagine that my journey would lead me to work with so many great people. I would like to thank first Dr. Stockton for seeing something in me long before I ever saw it. I would also like to thank Ms. Drummond, Dr. Hines, Dr. Sharples, Ms. Galatis and Dr. Gibson for investing so much time and effort to help me grow. 
I've worked with great staffs at many of our campuses throughout this district, and each of them have made me a better educator, leader, and man. And without them, I would not be here tonight. I especially want to thank those that are here tonight to support me. I also would not have imagined 15 years ago that this district could become such a large part of my family. I would like to introduce my family that's here tonight, and you will definitely see a theme occur through these introductions. My wife, Tanya, who is a kindergarten teacher at B.B. Rice. You got to stand. You got to stand. <laughs> My daughter Kaylee is a seventh grader at Pete Junior High. <laughs> Travis is a sophomore at Conroe High School. <laughs> My mom Linda is an art facilitator at Oak Ridge High School. <laughs> and my dad Mike, who is often referred to as Papa Noel on campuses, uh, is a super sub and a volunteer and active in our mentor program in Conroe High School. So I thank them for their support and the sacrifice that they make that allows me to do this work. So I thank you once again for this opportunity to serve our students, support staff, teachers, and administrators, and assure you that I will do all that I can do to make certain that they have an opportunity to reach their full potential. Thank you. Congratulations, Noel family. <laughs> Ken B, naming of Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Stockton. Well, I'm also uh, very excited to make uh, the next recommendation. Um, the, uh, the person I'm going to introduce um, is currently our Executive Director of Finance, uh, Darren Rice. Darren's been with us 25 years and is, is known throughout not only the district, but the state is probably the premier financial a person for the state of Texas um, and in our, in our conversation about working with other school districts he offhandedly said heck I've trained almost all of them <laughs> we've been very fortunate to have mr. rice um, with with us in CISD and I continue to um, be pleased with the progress that he's made and growth and not only um, in his position but in this future position to come so at this time I want to recommend Darren rice uh, for chief financial officer make a motion Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Rice. Thank you, President Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. I would like to thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to be the Chief Financial Officer for Connor ISD. Like Dr. Stockton said, I've worked in the finance department for CISD for 25 years. I started as the internal auditor, moved to controller, the position moved to director of finance, executive director of finance, and now it is an honor and a privilege to be chosen to lead the best finance department in the state of Texas. And, and with me saying that, I have some of my staff here this evening, uh, Karen Garza, Janice Stowers, Cindy Westrup, and Rick Reeves. Without them, we couldn't do it. So, thank y'all. Also, I would, I would especially like to thank Mr. Dan Cox. His leadership and guidance over the last 13 plus years, uh, Dan has been such a great mentor to me. And everything that I've learned from him has not only helped me get to where I am today, but it will help me in the future. Thank you, Dan. I have a couple of special guests here with me this evening that, that have supported me through my career. My lovely wife, Julie. My son, Jake. And, and, and just to give him some props, he's going to play baseball at Northwestern State, so he's got him a scholarship to All play right. baseball. Yeah. My daughter, Heather, wanted to be here, but she's a, student at South, she's a student at Southwestern University, and I did not want her to miss class. So, <laughs> so once again, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> 
And we're not trying to run anybody off, but that would be an excellent opportunity for any of you family members that have school early in the morning, <laughs> if you so choose uh, to depart. But uh, if you want to stay, make so them well. buy you dinner. That's right. I think uh, don't let him out for dinner. There. Mm, get him out of here. Congratulations, Rice family. That's awesome. Item 4A, Curriculum and Instructions, uh, Texas account uh, Accountability Summary. Dr. Stockton? I was just checking to see if Dr. Noah stayed. Okay, <laughs> okay so I'm going to call you up to give that presentation. You here too, Mr. Rice? You still here? Okay, good. <laughs> you saw they, they loved me enough to come, but they didn't love me enough to stay for the PowerPoint. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what that means. Uh, Travis said it's time to eat. Um, they heard it was going to be long. Winter. Yeah. They saw, they saw how long it was. Well, tonight we're going to provide an overview of the state accountability system, our graduation rate, SAT, ACT, advanced placement, and dual credit. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we'll have a, a little bit of information about the TELPASS uh, exam as well. That's required that we share that with you each year, and it just kind of fits in this presentation, so that's why it's here. Um, before we get started, I'm going to thank a great team we have. You know, uh, Dr. Hines, when when I was named deputy just now, I leaned over to Dr. Hines and I asked him, I said, do we, do we get a badge or anything for being a deputy? And he said, no, but you get this PowerPoint you can present. So thanks to Dr. Hines for doing a great job on this for many years and kind of being the keeper of this information. And then I'm going to introduce a few folks that are here that are truly the experts in this area and have put in a lot of work um, to make this report possible. Ms. Darren Carlisle, our coordinator of bilingual and ESL. There's Darren back there. Uh, Ms. Denise Sapola, coordinator of guidance and counseling. Debbie McNeely, Coordinator for Advanced Academic Programs. Julie English, our Coordinator of Assessment and Evaluation. Greg Shipp is our Coordinator of Career and Technical Education. He could not be here tonight. Veronica Martin Perkins is our College Readiness Specialist. And then uh, the Secretary in the Secondary Education Office, Ms. Isabel Gomez, and she is a gem. So let's say uh, thank you to all of them that have worked so hard with you. What I'm going to share tonight is the highlights of a 110-page document that you're welcome um, to peruse at your um, leisure. It is on our website, but I'm going to share with you tonight our, the highlights of that. Yeah. And we'll start with our state accountability summary, and, and I've got the little highlighter here. I'm going to just point out a few areas and that I'm going to go a little further into uh, in our presentation. First, you see at the top our accountability rating. We met standard. Um, for districts, you have two options to not meet standard or to meet standard. I'm proud to say that we did in all four uh, of the areas. The next section you will see is our performance index report. There are four indices, and I'm going to break each of those down uh, here in coming slides. Um, next, you'll see here on the right-hand side, district distinction. We did not earn a distinction, and I will give you the breakdown um, of our performance in that area. And then finally, here in the lower right-hand corner, you see system safeguards, and I'll also break that down uh, as we move forward. We start with index one, and that's the student achievement index. Uh, this provides an overview of student performance based on satisfactory student achievement across all subjects for all students. One thing I'd like to note this year is if you will remember, the state changed all the curriculum standards for math for elementary through eighth grade last year. The commissioner made a ruling that math would not be included in this year's accountability system. So when you see all subjects mentioned in all four of these indexes across the way, um, math is not included for elementary through eighth grade. Okay. Now, I will also share with you that I think if math was included, our scores would be even higher than they are because we perform very well in math. And, and so that bodes well for our future that next year we'll get to add math back in and I think we'll grow even more. So when you look at our performance in index one, the target score is 60. You see that we're uh, very high at an 87 state at a 77 and that target score of 60. Now, you remember we've talked about this simplified, easy to understand system for accountability and um, in the past. And it's a good system, but it, it's not, um, the numbers don't always add up as we think they would. And so for these next three indices, they, these are not percentages. So when you, when you see a number that's um, you know, not at 95, that doesn't mean that we're really performing at a 40% level. We gain points. You can earn points along the way. So the, the rest of the numbers you'll see in the next three indices are not percentages. So index two 
is a student progress measure, and it focuses on actual student growth, independent of overall achievement levels. So how much does each student grow every year? All right, it could be at the top end or low end, but do they get better every year? For index two, we are at a 40, the state was at 37, and the target score was a 20. Index three is closing the performance gaps. This emphasizes the academic achievement of the economically disadvantaged students and then up to the two lowest performing race and ethnicity groups um, across the district. Our score of 46, the state at a 40, the target score of a 28. And then index four, post-secondary readiness. This emphasizes the, important, the importance for students to receive a high school diploma that provides them with the foundation necessary for success in college, the workforce, job training programs, or the military. It also emphasizes the role that elementary and middle schools play in preparing students for high school. You can see there our score 81, the state at 75, and our target score is 57. So in all four uh, indices, we perform very well, well above the state and well above our targets. The next piece is the system safeguards. Uh, this portion disaggregates performance by student group in each subject area. We met 91% of our safeguards. That's 71 out of 80, 74 out of 81. The two areas that we did not meet safeguards, special education, graduation rate, and performance, and reading, math, writing, science, and social studies were below that standard, and then ELL performance in social studies. I will tell you that looking across the state, all of the districts that we would normally compare ourselves with, Katy, Cypher, Humble, theirs looks just like ours. These are areas that we know we need to grow uh, in these areas, and we'll continue to push um, to get better. One thing that changed this year for special education performance is the state did change the assessment. It took away the star M, which raised the rigor of the test for our students, and so it took us a step back. We, we have to gather ourselves, the students have to gather themselves as we raise the rigor of instruction for those students to prepare them to be successful in the future. And we are doing that. District distinctions, I mentioned to you that we did not earn a distinction. A district is only eligible for one distinction, and that's in index four, which is post-secondary readiness. Um, in order to earn a distinction, you have to have 70% of the potential measures be in the top quartile. Of, of compared to your light groups. Um, we did not make 70, we were at 38%. If you look at the districts around us in our region and our comparable group, 38% is very strong. We're not satisfied with it, we want 70, we want the distinction. Um, but this is a way to measure our progress and we feel like we are on the right track moving forward. Dr. Nell, do you yes. know how many public schools that have greater than 10,000 students did? receive a distinction I, I did not see any but I couldn't that's my verify that but n none in that's my expectation yes. but I just want most of the ones you see are single high school smaller correct town that's places right. yes okay. where, where, where did it get that that 70 from then I mean if I'm grading on it we need to curve that off a little bit don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can give you an email address if you'd like to send that to someone okay yeah, yeah. Uh, now going further into distinctions, campuses, individual campuses are also eligible for distinctions. And they can earn distinctions based on their performance in their 40 comparable groups. So campuses are, no, are now compared to a group of 40 schools that look like them demographically. And their goal is to be in the top quarter, the top 10 of that 40 group. And if they, if they make that standard, they can earn distinctions, and these are the areas in which they can earn distinctions. Student progress, closing achievement gaps, post-secondary readiness, and then academic uh, accolades in each of these subject areas. So we, we went through to look at all of our campuses and see how many distinctions did our campuses earn that, that were available to them. And I'm proud to report that once again, our campuses did very well. Very proud of them. We, our campuses earned 37% of the total distinctions that they possibly could have earned. And as you compare that to our um, districts that we, we like to compare to, we're, we're very pleased with what our campuses have done, very proud of them. 
We talked about TELPASS. TELPASS is the Texas English Language Proficiency Assessment System. Uh, it's part of the NCLB accountability system for our English language learners. Uh, states must show annual increases in progress for our ELLs, making uh, that they make progress in learning English and attaining proficiency. When we look at our TELPASS, there are four language domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then within those four domains, there are four proficiency levels. Uh, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. And just to highlight, what, what does that mean? Uh, beginning is little or no English ability. Intermediate is limited ability, simple language structures, high frequency vocabulary, and routine context. As they move to advanced, uh, they are grade appropriate with their English with second language acquisition support. And as advanced high, uh, they are now grade appropriate with minimal second language acquisition support. One of the key features of TELPASS as it relates to uh, our students is in order to exit the bilingual program, they not only need to pass a STAR exam, they need to move to advanced high in TELPASS. So it's significant for our students to, to continue to move up the system. Now I'm going to show you a chart, and it's a lot of numbers. <laughs> okay, this is, a lot of, this is a lot going on. I'm just going to kind of share with you um, what we feel like is significant here. What, what you're seeing in the left-hand column is each grade level and how many students are in that grade level um, that are considered ELL students. Across the remainder of the chart, you're seeing the percentage of those that are in each, um, each performance group on the tail pass. Now, there are a few things that I believe are significant. If you stay on the left-hand column, you will notice here at third grade, 903, and then you move to fourth grade and you begin to see numbers really start to fall off. What that tells us is students are passing STAR, they're moving to advanced high, and they're exiting the program. You're seeing fewer and fewer students in the program. If you look across, now these are, you're not looking at the same kids year to year, so it's not quite right. a true apples to apples, but we would hope to see that as students move through our system, that, that the percentages would get higher and higher on the advanced and advanced high end and lower on the beginning and intermediate and that's what we see uh, one thing we notice is down here in ninth grade you see a bump again uh, of beginning students we have a lot of students that move in ninth you know come to our country in ninth grade um, but I, i'm very impressed with the work our high school teachers do when you see 14 and 18 uh, as beginning students in ninth and tenth grade and then such a drop off mm -hmm. in 11th and 12th the the speed of language acquisition of those students is just, it exemplifies the great work that our staff does really with those students. So uh, those are our tail pass results, really um, good information and we're proud of the, that work. Now this is that slide that Dr. Stockton always talks about. If we just had one slide, this would be the slide, right? This would be our one, our graduation rate. And we're proud to say that we continue to be strong in our graduation rate at 95.1. The state is at 88. The state is really coming up, and, that, and that's great. But we continue to be strong and well above the state average. And here's a breakdown a little further. This is a class of 2013, and you can see our 95.1 there. Um, we're the big Pac-Man on the left, and a lot of blue, and that's how we want it to be, a lot of blue. Uh, if you look at the purple section there, which is the next largest section at 2.2, those are continuers. So those are students that we hope are going to be high school graduates before they're finished it may never show up in the state accountability system but that's not what it's about it, it'll show up in their life and that's that's our goal so we want to keep pushing those students to move forward and you can see how we compare to the state our graduation plans this shows a very healthy growth uh, over many years the pink section in the middle is our recommended high school program and the blue section at the bottom is our Distinguished Achievement Program. The green section at the top represents our minimum program. And we're happy with all of our high school graduates, but our goal would be for each of them to take the most rigorous curriculum possible. It's gonna prepare them for college, the workforce, whatever it is they choose to do. And you can see over time, we continue to decrease the number of students on the minimum plan and increase the number of students on the Distinguished Academic Program. And that's a great thing. And we will see th this slide is what drives the next slides I'm going to show you. When you talk about SAT, ACT performance, the reason that we continue to grow is because we continue to push kids into hard curriculum 
and, and support them when they get there and helps them be successful. Now, I will remind you that the graduation requirements have, are changing, our sophomores and below. So the, it's always nice to see this long longitudinal data, but it'll change on us in a couple of years because we'll have new graduation programs. So we'll kind of renorm as we move forward. Our SAT performance, um, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, you remember, uh, I think it was four or five months back, Mr. Husbands, you shared with everyone that Lone Star College chart that showed our SAT and ACT performance um, really outpacing all those around us and um, excited to tell you that I'm going to show you numbers that are higher than they were last year. So um, you look here, you'll see that um, our school of critical reading at 530, math at 545, and writing at 508, that puts our combined three test total at 1583, which is a 16 point improvement from last year. Um, very strong. You look at our trend, and this is a multi-year trend looking at just critical reading and math. This becomes more significant because the SAT is changing. Our students just took a new PSAT last week that's under the new format, and they've gone back. They've bounced a few times. They've gone back now to just reading and math tests. They've eliminated the writing test. So in the future, this is all the only measure there will be is just reading and math. And so you can see um, while the state and the nation both have trended down, we're trending up. Um, and we're proud of that at 1075 uh, for our two tests combined total this year. And our SAT participation remains strong. We're down a few students from last year, but not, not a significant number and not one that would change our average scores. Um, we continue to test many kids and will continue to push for many more. Now, part of the uh, SAT program is the PSAT. And the PSAT serves as the National Merit Qualifying Exam. And we, we talk about our National Merit Scholars, and those are the students that reach the top 1% of test takers on the PSAT as juniors across the state. We'll actually have a chance to meet the 23 kids that are represented on that far right bar. You're gonna meet them next month. They'll be here and we'll get a chance to honor them. Um, and you can see that we, we did show a dip uh, from the last two years. And we were really strong in the last two years. I don't know if that's a little bit of a re-norm. It's not something that we're satisfied with. And one of the things that we're, we do to try to improve this is we begin now our eighth graders this week and last week are taking the PSAT 8, so they are all eighth graders being exposed to this. As, and then our ninth grade, we have many ninth graders that take it, it's optional, but we as a district support all of our 10th graders to take the PSAT, and then they all take it again as an 11th grader, and that is the year that it counts for national merit. So we begin identifying kids in eighth grade that show this potential, and we bring resources and study materials and everything to them. Additionally, we, we use that data to help pull more and more kids into that AP and pre-AP curriculum, but um, we are focused on this. This is a number that we want to see increase. Our ACT trend, this is the other college entrance exam, um, and it was included on that chart that Mr. Husband showed. Our composite score this year is 24.1. That's 0.6 higher than last year. Um, and you can see from the over the last four years, we're, we're really skyrocketing. And I, I'm not sure exactly what happened in 2012. I will tell you, I mean, these are normed tests nationally. So sometimes they do just they just bring the scores down. And I don't know if that's what happened in 2012, but very pleased to see that we've really increased and, and gotten now back above the bar uh, over the last four years. The ACT has different subject area tests too. So we would look at this to just want to make sure that all of our subject lines basically reflect the, the overall composite score that we're, we're meeting the needs of our students in each of their courses. And you can see there by, by those lines that we are. Um, we certainly have our strengths, but all of them are trending up as we would hope they would. And here are those ACT uh, results compared to the nation uh, and the state across all subject areas and that 24.1 uh, composite is very strong. ACT college readiness. I would explain to you uh, exactly what is meant by ACT college readiness if I could understand the formulas, but I can't because the number is different on every test. So it's not 
like if you get a 23 on every test you're considered college ready they don't release the information that way they look at their data and they they decide where that number is and that's where they draw it the end result is they draw a line somewhere and you'd like to be above that line and you'd like for your students to be above that line and if you look at our students now it's more than half of our students are above that line in all four tests which is fantastic Advanced placement, you know, advanced placement are those courses taught at the college level in our high schools. At the conclusion of the test, or the, the course, the students take a test. If they make a high enough score on that test, they receive college credit. You can see that once again, we have increased uh, the number of students taking tests up to 4,121. Those students took a total of 9,155 exams. So increase the number of exams, and how did we do? Well, our mean score is at 2.86. That's on a scale of five. Okay, you can, that's the highest as you can get, so it's a five. But you can see still well, uh, well above the state and above the national average is our performance on these AP exams. As a parent, you really appreciate that. You want them, they go through the class, you want to make sure that they, they're performing on the test. Didn't the state change that at state schools, they have to give them credit if they score three or better is they do three or better is, is at a state school at the state schools and they they do different things of how they award that credit or if it's an elective or do they take it that some of those things still happen but yes they will okay. these are our top advanced placement exams uh, by number of tests given the thing that i will point out on here that's most exciting is the top line there human geography that was not the number one test last year it was down i believe number four number five and you can see to this this past year 829 students and here's why that's significant we made a change in the curriculum allowing freshmen to take ap human geography as a replacement for world geography as their freshman social studies credit earning class floodgates open and students poured in so this 829 represents a lot of freshmen taking an ap test wow we get them locked in as freshmen we get them on that track our hope is that all the numbers below are going to now continue to balloon and not only did they take the test but they performed very well on the test you saw that our our average score was 2.86 across all of our tests ap human geography 3.04 was our average so many took it and they did well so hopefully that will pay dividends in the future on all of our tests uh, the other way that we earn college credit in high school is dual credit fortunate to have Lone Star College right here in the heart of our district and we have many students that take advantage of this opportunity of courses that are taught in our high schools by instructors that are both ours and work with Lone Star so they earn our credit and Lone Star credit at the same time you can see the courses there that that our students take English 1301 is our number one course um, and, and then history also. So you look at the, the entry level English and history are our two most common courses. 2,029 total uh, enrollments last year with Lone Star College. And if you just look at our fall, we look at what we have enrolled this year in dual credit, and that's 959, up just a couple of students from last year, but very healthy number of students enrolled in dual credit presently. really one of the newer things to us and we're fortunate to have the Conroe Center of Lone Star College right here as well are our workforce programs and this is a growing area for us kind of a, a newer endeavor but uh, last year we had eight students complete the welding program 15 students complete uh, phlebotomy and seven uh, complete computer numeric controls operation and programming and I will note to you we only get 15 seats in these programs that's the most that we can get so we, we try more but that's that's all that they can give us to accommodate this year we've added auto tech to this mix and all four programs this year are full 15 students in all four programs and then in the future next year we're also going to add EMT to that mix so we'll continue to develop this, this is a great partnership for us uh, Mr. Ship does a fantastic job working with Lone Star College to make these possible for our students is the 15 seats a Lone Star issue? It is. It's a Lone Star issue. Or is it a capacity, like classroom issue? I think it's their capacity of just what that they can teach. Okay. Um, we continue to work with them, and we 
we push to try to get more, and if we can get more, we'll absolutely take advantage of it. One of the challenges th that we do run into with that program is, while it's not far from here, the Conroe Center, it is a far from South County, so it, you know some students can't make that trip happen. But we're fortunate that they don't have to go there to, that's not the only avenue they have to get CTE certifications. We do it on all of our high school campuses, and this slide represents these certifications that our students get can get at any of, any of our campuses. And you see 886 total certifications last year. Um, our number one, 224 students received that OSHA 10-hour safety, which is a generic safety certification that will allow them to really become employable at a lot of different fields. Um, that's a great certification for them. Um, you see Valvoline Oil and the uh, Temkin Bearing Auto Tech uh, 54 and 50. That, that will get students directly working in the automotive industry. And then over, you'll see a two in the welding area as well. And uh, I know times might be a little tougher for those students now um, with the oil downturn, but those students are employable and yep. those are good jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very high paying and they can, that's a career uh, for those students when they move forward. We do survey our, our high school graduates every year and ask them, what, it, what are your plans when you're, when you're gonna leave us? And um, this is the response from last year. And now they can give us more than one response. So when you start adding this up, it doesn't add up to 100 necessarily because they might've told us more than one thing, but 60% of them tell us they're gonna uh, go to a four-year college, 27% to a two-year college, that's a number that continues to increase, and 15% to a vocational tech school, that's a number that is really exploding. Um, and then you can see further there, working full-time, 7%, going to the military, 4%. Can, well, can I ahead. ask a quick question? You can. Um, with the two-year and the vo uh, vocational technical school mm -hmm. going up, are we seeing the four-year college go down, or is that staying? It's, it's decreased a little. A little. But, okay. it, but there's still, I mean, still 60%. No, I've, yeah. I've, but it, I've played, certainly, I mean. it has gone down some. Right. Um, but still pretty high okay and this is self-reported too i'll tell well, you so that you know i'm all for going be, to a two-year college yeah. and saving money we could so. have we could have quite a few <laughs> students here that that the plan was a four-year school and they might have diverted <coughs> after they completed this uh, but okay. where do they go when they go to four-year universities we get data back from the state schools um, that tell us and, and a few of our private schools in the state that tell us that our students are there. So that class of 2014, where did they go last year? You can see that Texas A&M is our number one. <laughs> yes, and I knew that was going to happen. Uh, our number one destination. All right. Um, University of Texas at Austin is our second largest. And then uh, Sam Houston right up the road, a great opportunity for some students there. And then uh, University of Houston, Texas Tech, and Texas State kind of uh, right there as well. But a lot of you know, we're fortunate to have a lot of great schools right here in the boundary. And LSU there with 22. Uh, yeah. That's that cream of the crop, right? Okay. That's, <laughs> I'm going to go to the next slide. Here we go. And, and just before I conclude, I'm going to kind of give a little bit of a, a commercial for two of our. Back up to that previous slide. Uh, or, okay. Louisiana State University. Uh oh. And, and oh oh man. Is, yeah. Hey, I would, I would like to. That's Floridian like right there. I'm sure. This is a uh, Florida Gator. It's spelled yeah. on this. The Florida Gator did not spell it. Hey, it was spelled right. It was spelled right before Saturday night. I had to go back in and adjust it after that. I like to adjust my vote. You got it right, boy. Yeah, I just couldn't. Just couldn't handle it. Adjust my previous vote on that. <laughs> They only know it by the initials anyway. That's right. <laughs> so as I wrap this up, I wanted, I just want to give a little commercial here, a little shout out for two of our great programs that we do. And they both happen to, uh, to be held at the Lone Star Convention Center, which um, is very generous with us and allowing us to have these events there. We have our college night, which uh, occurred last month. Uh, we had 190 schools represented at college night and about 5,000 attendees came out to walk through, talk to college representatives, get information, fantastic program. And then next month, we'll have our career expo, which is also, the, like I said, at the Lone Star Convention Center. And Greg Ship leads this. We'll have 75, 75 booths of employers there to talk to our students. And we've opened this event now this year to our surrounding districts as well to try to be good citizens and just get more folks there. Um, but they'll be there to talk to students about maybe jobs that they can get right out of coming out of high school, but they'll also be talking about 
jobs down the road. You know, so if, if Halliburton or one of these big, you know, oil companies is there, they may also they may talk about oil field jobs that a student can get coming out, welding, that type, but they'll also be engineers they're talking about corporate jobs that they may get in the future. So I would encourage anyone and everyone to come out um, to the Career Expo on November 12th uh, from 5 to 8. It's a, it's a great experience there. How many employers you say were out there? 75. 75, 75 booths. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And they range from, I, I know that I've talked to some uh, firemen, that, you know, they're going to be out there, the fire department and oil companies. There's a big range of different organizations and folks that will be there. I have a question. Yes, sir. And this is no, there's not a right or wrong answer to this question. The parent comes up to us mm -hmm. and says, why, I guess, is the district, as far as the state, and it looks like the statistics uh, across the nation, why is there such a focus on AP testing? Why is the class about passing the test? What is our answer to that? If, if you're in an AP course, in order to get the college credit for being in that course, you must pass that test. Oh, no, no I know okay. the, I know all of that. Okay. The, the question is, from a philosophical or policy question, why is there such, in education now, why is there such a big push for AP testing? Mm -hmm. Is it simply economical because you can, mm -hmm. is that the number one goal or are we, is there a for, other first and, philosophical yeah. answers? First and foremost, we would, we would love our students to take the most rigorous curriculum that they are capable of taking. And so for us, because we offer AP and dual credit as advanced level courses, that's where those students would track. And so we want to push them to do their very best wherever it may be. Now, we don't just focus on that track. You know, we like to have this, just as much emphasis and spend just as much time working on the CTE program. And what used to be, and we, we talk about CTE, it used to be in that uh, a divergent move. You know, you right. either were academic or you were workforce development. We don't do this anymore. They're, they're together, and you can do both. And so. Um, we want students to challenge themselves and, and maybe in those classes and it may be through other courses. That's the, really the biggest thing. Mr. Noll, I, mm -hmm. I would also add to that explanation as a parent, mm -hmm. all three of my girls have been prepared to go to college and it's been proven against other students that have come from other places or whatever that, that they were better prepared. Mm -hmm. And even if you go to a private school that doesn't take the three and you don't get the AP credit, if you can pass the courses that they're offering there because you had that rigor, that, that preparation is where it is, it is absolutely essential. And so I would just add as a parent, thank you for having AP classes and whether my, my girls passed them or not or whether they made a high enough grade to get the credit or not is, is, is virtually immaterial, even though it, it helps. Scott, kind of to my point, I'll oh, go ahead. No, you sir, go ahead. Well, I think it, you know, depends on the student. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have three three sons in CISD, and um, I would love for my youngest. I mean, you understand the aptitude of the kid, mm -hmm. and I would push him and push him, and the rigor associated with AP classes, idea. But my other two I have to understand the aptitude that they have, and I don't wouldn't want to stress them to the point to where anxiety starts to kick in, and it's, it's you just have to understand and know your kids as it relates to what you try to push them toward. But it's, it's an exceptional opportunity for the kids with the AP course, but you have to, from a parent's perspective, from my perspective, I have to make sure that I'm cautious of what my kids' are, kids' aptitudes are and, and their level of stress tolerance. Um, and that's going to dictate how much I push them toward those AP classes and more advanced classes. And I would, I wouldn't, I'd say that the AP classes do prepare the kids more so, uh, better. But, but certain kids have certain aptitudes, and I don't want to push them toward those classes at the sacrifice of their mental and physical Absolutely. health. You know, it, and that's just, that's just me as a parent, and I see that. You know, right. And, and that's the whole key is, it's not one size fits all. It never right. will be, and it shouldn't be. It's about every individual kid, and so it's making those decisions that what suits every kid, the best. Right. And, I will tell you that we take pride in the fact that you don't have to be in an, in an AP or dual credit class to get a great education at Precisely. any of our high schools. You will I get agree. a great education in every single one of our classrooms. I agree. Absolutely. I hope I answered that, Mr. Kidd. I, no, no, I, 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 I mean, I, we've experienced 
this, and I mm -hmm. echo the you know our kids are in our district are better prepared than you know than any, any of them. But I just I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing down the road the, the statistics or the communication with, and I'm sure that's ongoing with mm -hmm. colleges because you're placing out a lot of these historically courses you take as freshman sophomore in college mm -hmm. uh, and just wanting to see if you're missing out on some of that foundation there as you're and you often know. oftentimes I would tell you that the, the universities may accept or, or give you credit in the, the courses that maybe aren't in your major they, uh, for example if you're going to go to to texas a&m as an engineering major they're probably still going to want you to take their calculus mm -hmm. and their physics even if you took it in high school and, and it's probably a good idea to do it because you want to be there with your peers so they may give you your english credit maybe a history credit but they're going to they're going to say that math credit should be an elective and we want you in art <coughs> so that's a you know a counseling decision when they get to the mm -hmm. university as to what they do I think it's a great thing. It's just a question that comes up in sure. discussion Absolutely. quite a bit in my experience. Absolutely. The only Thanks. thing I'll add to the conversation is, uh, in, a, in addition to all those things, we take great pride in offering great safety nets for kids mm -hmm. and support systems. Mm -hmm. So no matter where the child is, uh, you know, in the academic spectrum, uh, we're here to support them. And oftentimes, once they get out of our school system, those support systems aren't in place. So that's, that's, we're really proud of that. Our teachers are doing a fantastic job. Our counselors, APs, uh, principals, um, in order for our kids to achieve whatever level they can achieve. I agree. Pick it up. No? Thank you. Thank you. Item 4B, approval of 2015-16 district improvement plans. Dr. Stockton. Okay, I'm gonna ask Dr. Hines to come present that item. Good evening, President Husbands. Members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton, each year we come forward to ask your approval of the district improvement plan. And the district has developed a fluid working document that is our district plan that serves to guide the district and campus staff Couldn't have in, to announce that. <laughs> in the attainment of the in the attainment of the district's vision and goals through a continuous cycle of improvement. Now, this plan encompasses the goals of the district, the annual performance objectives, the improvement strategies to achieve each objective, the persons responsible for the oversight of the strategy, the timeline for ongoing monitoring of these strategies, the resources needed to implement the identified strategies, the formative evaluation of each strategy, and the summative indicator for each performance objective. And we do include objectives for all of our student groups. As evidence with the prior presentation that you just uh, heard, as part of our continuous improvement cycle, a comprehensive performance evaluation and needs assessment is conducted annually to study multiple types of data on student performance and target outcomes. To, and we analyze the trends, the patterns within and across the data to identify those areas for improvement. And the results are used in the development of the annual measurable performance objectives and the strategies that will ensure the attainment of these goals. The student performance data on the state assessment of academic readiness or the STAR test, as well as additional information from the Texas Accountability System Performance Report, the performance-based monitoring system, which we call PBMAS, and there are other accountability systems that provide the preponderance of the data that, that is used in um, this evaluation. Um, we also include inf uh, input from parents, community, business leaders, administrators, and teachers to the district-level planning and decision-making committee as well as campus principals, teachers, the curriculum and instruction teams, some of which you met this evening, the, the cabinet members and others. And so tonight we ask your approval of our district plan. So and move. A motion. Second. And a second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed like sign. Thank you very much. Item uh, 4C. Approval of 2015-16 Campus Improvement Plans. Dr. Stockton. Uh, I apologize for my phone going off <laughs> with, oh, with, some, with some unknown song that started playing. I apologize. I have no, <laughs> no clue what just happened. Um, I'm going to go back to the flip phone, by the way. <laughs> okay. okay um, I'll ask Shelly Winkler, Director of Elementary Education, to come present <laughs> the uh, Campus Improvement Plans. 
Good evening, President, husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. Each year, campuses are required to develop a campus improvement plan with the assistance of their site-based development um, a site-based decision-making committee. The purpose of the plan is to improve student performance. Over the past few weeks, uh, members of the board have had an opportunity to review each of the plans submitted by the campuses. Campus improvement plans must assess academic achievement using the Texas Academic Performance Reports and set objectives. Goals and objectives support the district improvement plan as well as the state's goal to ensure that all Texas children have, a have access to a quality education. Each of our campuses have worked diligently to ensure their campus improvement plan captures current strategies being implemented and that these plans um, and know that these plans are living documents and can and should be modified throughout the school year to meet the needs of the campus. This evening we ask that you approve the campus improvement plans for the 2015-2016 school year. I hear a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed the light sign. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Winkler. Um, item 5A, Dr. Stockton. Uh, 5A, I'm going to ask to pull that item off the agenda and bring it back at a later time. Item 5B, recommendation for to select a geotechnical service provider, Dr. Stockton. Uh, I'll ask Easy Foster, our Director <laughs> of Planning and Construction, to come present that item. President, husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my pleasure to bring forward for you tonight in your consideration uh, a request for approval of the recommended companies to perform the required geotechnical services and authorize Dr. Do Dr. Stockton to negotiate and execute the necessary contracts as the projects are developed. These selections are intended to be for the same duration as our upcoming 2015 bond referendum. A request for qualifications for geotech services was advertised in both the Houston Chronicle and the Conroe Courier and we had eight companies respond. The responses of each was carefully reviewed and the companies that are recommended for selection are believed to be highly qualified based on their demonstrated competency and their qualifications. The district also believes we'll be able to negotiate fair and reasonable prices for these services and the following companies are recommended as for the selection. HTS, Terracon, Paradigm, and Raba Kistner. This time we request your approval of these selections. Motion. I have, move. A, I have a motion. I second the motion. And I have a second. Any discussion? Questions for Mr. Foster? All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. <coughs> Item 5C, recommendation for selection of surveying service providers. Dr. Stockton. Uh, Mr. Foster, please. Again, at this time, I request your approval of the recommended companies to perform survey services and authorize Dr. Stockton to negotiate and execute the necessary contract documents as we develop projects <clears throat> moving forward. The selections are also intended to be for the same duration as the upcoming 2015 bond referendum. And like before, for uh, we published a request for qualifications for engineering services and advertised that in the Houston Chronicle and the Conroe Courier. We had nine companies respond, and each of these responses was carefully reviewed. The companies recommended for selection are believed to be highly qualified based on their demonstrated competency and qualifications. The district also believes we'll be able to negotiate fair and reasonable prices for these services. The following individuals or companies are recommended for selection. They are Jones and Carter, West Belt, and Landtech. At this time, we appreciate, uh, request your approval of this selection. So move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Item 5D, recommendation of selection of test and balance service provider, Dr. Stockton. And one more time, I bring forward for your uh, approval, I request your approval for the recommended companies to perform test and balance services. And again, authorize Dr. Don Stockton to negotiate and execute the necessary contract documents as we develop projects. The selections again are intended to be for the same duration as the upcoming 2015 bond referendum. And like before, we publish a request for qualifications and advertise this in the Houston Chronicle and Conroe Courier. 
We had five companies respond, and each of these responses were carefully reviewed, and the companies recommended for selection are believed to be highly qualified based on their demonstrated competency and their qualifications. <coughs> we also believe we will be able to negotiate fair and reasonable prices for these services. The following companies are recommended for selection. TAB Technologies, Mesa Commissioning, and Engineered Air Balance. This time we request your approval of these selections. So move. Second. Thank you. All, uh, any discussion, questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. And 5E, Capital Impro Improvements Update, uh, Stockton. Hey, one more time. I'd like to give you an update for the Woodlands High School locker room, which you approved the GMP not long ago. Uh, I don't have any pictures yet because we're still working on the underground. We've been working with the local utility providers to relocate the utilities that are running within the, the boundaries of the building addition. So we've been working with Centerpoint Energy to relocate a, a gas line that feeds the Woodlands High School. That process has been started, engineered, and will be complete within the next couple of weeks. We've also been working with Intergy to relocate one of the primary electrical feeds uh, for the, the back half of the building. Uh, we've also engineered that with Intergy, uh, paid the necessary fees, now we're waiting on their schedule to, to uh, install and reconnect the, the wiring. Once these are done, which should all be done within the next few weeks, we'll be able to start rigorously working on the building additions, which is the next phase of, of that project. So hopefully I can bring you some pictures to the next, next board meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Foster, for everything and all your hard work. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, other gentlemen, for being here tonight. Uh, item 6A, financial reports, Dr. Stockton. Uh, Mr. Rice, if you'll come produce, uh, present those reports. Mr. Rice, we, we greatly appreciate how well prepared you are for each one of these meetings and appreciate how much time and effort you and your staff put into these reports. But I would like to give you an option to take the night off and join the festivities with the family, if that's okay with them. Is that all right with everyone? I'd actually like to see the report. Okay. Very good. Good evening, President Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. I'm here this evening to present the financial statements for the district for the month of September. These statements will include the general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. The balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances. Uh, each month, we like to look at our cash and investments. So as we look at them, we'll concentrate here on the general fund. We have cash on hand of $13,300. We have bank deposits of $1.5 million. Investments in the pools, $48.5 million. Investments in our Capital One Now account, $42.5 million. Investments that are less than one year, $24 million. And longer term investments, $45.4 million for total cash investments of $162 million. The next statement that we're going to look at this evening is the income statement. The income statement shows our revenues, our expenditures, and our fund balances for each of the funds. In the revenue category, we have uh, local and intermediate sources, our state program revenues, and our federal program revenues. If you look in the general fund, you can see we received a state payment in the month of September, around about $45 million. And we can look at our total expenditures uh, at the functional level for each of the funds. And once again, instruction is our highest area of expenditures in the general fund. Now to take a look at our bond transition plan. This is the $109 million bond transition plan to get us to the uh, 2015 bond referendum. We've currently expended and encumbered $83.9 million. We have an estimated to complete $21.7 million. The majority of those funds are found in technology and land purchases. Um, for a projected uh, forecast of $105.6 million, leaving us with uh, available funds of $3.3 million. Our self-funded insurance plan uh, for the month of September, we actually had a good month in September. Uh, we had total revenues of $3.3 million, total expenses of $3.2 million for revenues over expenses of $109,000, so a good month for September. Uh, participation at our wellness centers, uh, the Oak Ridge Center, we had 481 visitors, and at Conroe, 171 for a total of 652. Our investments for the month. We ended August at $226 million invested. 
In September, $239 million invested. That up, uptick was due to the large state payment uh, that we got in. The wham of the pools into Capital One is one day, yielding almost 20 basis points now. The wham of our investments that are less than one year long is 239 days, and they're yielding 43 basis points. The wham of our longer term investments is 737 days, yielding over a percent. And the wham of our, our combined portfolio is 131 days, and we're yielding 34 basis points. And our benchmark, which is the 90 day T bill, 0.003. And that is all I have. Any questions? I have two questions. Yes, sir. One is the state payment that we received was 40, 46, 40, 46, 47, well, it was 47, 47 million dollars. Million million yes, sir. Dollars. That's the first payment that we got this year. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. And so we started school in third week of August. Yes, sir. And we had to have enough funds on hand to be able to take care of August and pretty much most of September. So had we not had a, a nice, healthy general fund balance, we might have had to change our answer when we said we had to go out and borrow short term. Yes, sir. That okay. is correct. All right. Thank you. Oh, the other question I had was about the investments. Yes, sir. I know we list them at par, but mm -hmm. I'm sure we get some sort of mark to market report. Do we do any trading within that investment portfolio? Normally, we, we hold everything to maturity. So it's all HTM? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> thank you again, Mr. Rice. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rice. Thank you, sir. <coughs> sir. Close. Excuse me. Closed session of the board now be held on matters contained in the notice for this meeting is authorized by Section 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be either, be at either, excuse me, uh, a, this public meeting upon the rec reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at the subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. The closed session of the board will now be held. It is 7.25. Okay, we're back in session. It's 8 o'clock. Item 9A, uh, proposed termination, authorized notice, proposing termination of employment contract of Kirsten Raglan. Dr. Stock. I will turn this over to uh, Mrs. Galavis. We received information previously about our recommendation to terminate the term employment contract of Ms. Raglan. We ask that you go ahead and propose that this evening so notice can be sent to her. I move that the board propose the termination of the term contract of Kirsten Raglan for good cause and further move that the board authorize the superintendent to provide Ms. Raglan notice of this action. I second the motion. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Motion passes. Uh, motion, I, to adjourn. motion to adjourn. Thank you and good night. Everybody.